Welcome back to the Mining Pod. On this week's show, we're joined by Dennis Porter of the Satoshi Action Group to discuss Bitcoin mining and politics. We're mainly focused on the national security concerns when it comes to Bitcoin mining. So we discussed with Dennis about moving into state houses and lobbying on behalf of the Bitcoin mining industry. As a note, Dennis is throwing a dinner at the end of this week on Friday at the North American Blockchain Summit. Be sure to use promo code MININGPOD to get 25% off your ticket. We'll be seeing you down in Fort Worth. Do you have dinner plans November 17th? Well, you do now. Down in Fort Worth, Texas at the North American Blockchain Summit, Satoshi Action Group is hosting a dinner along with a lot of our friends in the Bitcoin mining industry. You can join us November 17th at 6.30 p.m. by going to satoshidinner.com and using promo code MININGPOD to get 25% off your ticket. Again, that's satoshidinner.com. Use code MININGPOD to get 25% off your ticket. We'll be seeing you there. Did you know that you can make more money by merge mining other networks? Check out makemoremoneymining.com for information on BIPs 300 and 301, a proposal to bring more revenue to Bitcoin miners through sidechains and merge mining called drive chains. Increase your mining revenues and learn more about participating in Bitcoin governance by visiting makemoremoneymining.com. Are you a miner who wants to activate Bitcoin improvements? Check out activation.watch. See what Bitcoin improvements the Bitcoin community, developers, and miners are considering and show support by signaling for one of many BIPs up for consideration. Activation.watch. Is your mining operation happening ready? Take control of your own future with the right energy strategy. Linkcoin Energy Trading Platform is a tool used by miners to design, monitor, and seamlessly orchestrate sophisticated energy strategies within electricity markets such as ERCOT, New York, and PJM. Avoid penalties, participate in demand response programs, and capture hundreds of thousands of dollars per megawatt per year by deploying the right block and index strategy. Secure your competitive edge at Linkcoin.com. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ-listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data-dependent stories at theminermag.com. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Dennis is joining me today. Dennis Porter, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing excellent. Uh, just coming back from a break, so uh, ready to dive into a, a jam-packed week of back-to-back -back calls. Yeah, nice and tan back from your uh from your travels right yeah this is as tan as i get too so it's like you know yeah. 10 days 10 days in the sun and this is as good as, as good as it gets so just everyone's prepared for that are you ready to jump back into the bitcoin grind or did you like really stop when you were uh vacationing uh i um, i don't never really truly fully stop working the tweets so keep I'm, coming huh yeah it's an unfortunate byproduct of working in a 24 7 365 non-stop nascent ever faster moving industry yeah. that is bitcoin bitcoin mining when it combines two crazy worlds the one that i work in which is uh bitcoin bitcoin mining side which is the 24 7 365 thing and then it's the p political realm which is yeah. just a total mess all the time so it's a great combo yeah if i remember you talking don't to want you. to stay sane <laughs> yeah yeah exactly my point i was about to make you took the words out of my mouth i remember talking to you like a year ago about the political side of things i was like i don't know why anyone would ever want to get in that world at all you're like oh i love it i love the i love the pool i love being in the midst of it and still today don't get it probably won't ever but i'm glad there's people like you who care about it and we you know agree on most things when especially when it comes to bitcoin mining so I'm glad that's there okay let's transition over to satoshi action fund uh so yeah. you're the president and ceo you founded it it's been two years or so um it's been a little over a year we launched in june okay. of last year and I am, yeah, I'm the president CEO. I say CEO and president of Satoshi Action. I'm, there are two organizations now, actually. One is Satoshi Action Fund and one is Satoshi Action Education. One I'm the CEO of and one I'm the president of. So um, for simplicity's sake, we just say it's all under the Satoshi Action umbrella. Um, but yeah, it's been going really, really well. We've had a ton of success and I'm sure we'll jump into that. But I launched that in June of last year and we've been off to the races ever since. Yeah, let's go into it a little bit. And then we have much more talk in the show. Specifically, we brought you on to talk about all the recent headlines with like rural Bitcoin mining and like the pushback. Uh, we had a New York Times article about that. There's some stuff in Arkansas going on. So we'll get to that probably towards the second half of the show. But let's talk about Satoshi Action Fund, some wins recently, and then maybe like a little more fleshed out what you guys are trying to, to work on as like the uh, product, if you could say that for, I guess, a, a lobbying organization. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and that's, that's probably one good area to start though with when it talk, when comes talking about Satoshi action is the one big difference between us and let's say like a lobbying organization or even a trade association is that we don't, we don't actually like do most of the lobbying. In fact, we, we hire lobbyists and we don't have members. We have donors, like more or less the, the premise of Satoshi action is that if you believe in the mission that we have pursued, which is to make the United States one of the best places in the world to be a Bitcoin miner or to be a Bitcoiner, um, then you want to support us. If, if, if you agree with, you know, having the opportunity to stay here in America that's thriving off of this new technology versus being forced to move abroad, you know, that again is why I created Satoshi Action. I think it's why people buy, buy into the vision and the mission of what we're doing. Um, but we're very, very, we're structured very, very different from, from any of these other organizations that you might see out there. Um, once we launched Satoshi Action, the first thing that we wanted to do was try to go out there and show right off the bat, what could we do? How could we be successful? How could we show that we can be effective? Because one of the most dangerous things that you can do with a political organization is, you know, get out there, do all this, you know, make all this noise, and then you don't produce any results. You can do that a couple of times. You can even do it for years, but eventually people will grow tired and they will move on and they will want to hear from someone else. They will want to see someone else produce results. There, there's definitely two the unfortunate part about politics is there's sort of two things you have to do. One is you do have to produce results. And the other is you have to market your results, market even what you're trying to do so that you can get people to buy into that vision, buy into what you're trying to accomplish and fund, essentially fund your operation. Because hundred almost 100%, aside from our like, you know, two, three little S19 miners that we have plugged in uh, that were donated to us, you know, the vast majority of our money comes from either donations or people that we get to come to our events, which is essentially a form of a donation. So we rely a lot on on our donors to support the work that we do uh, on a constant basis. Um, but right away, we wanted to make sure that we were proving to our donors that we were having success. So we said, okay, what can we do? We we got to the drawing board right away. We brought on Eric Peterson, who is our current uh, policy director, who's a wizard uh, in the policy world. And um, we had my two co-founders, Mandy and Surya, and we sat down and we were like, all right, what are we gonna do? We started crafting public policy, model policy, um, for the Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining space. And what that means is that we created sort of like this, like, okay, here is a example of a bill you could pass in your state that helps you advance this industry. You know, what we would do is we'd go in, we'd say, okay, we have this great bill that we wrote up and we think you should pass it. It'll really help you. And they'll say like, you know, why would you want me to do that? And like, we go in and we pitch, we say, okay, Bitcoin mining is great for jobs, great for local investment, great stability, environmental cleanup, and the ability to enhance uh, green and renewable energy projects, really any energy project, but policymakers, particularly like when you can help solve some of the problems with uh, green energy. And then we, when, then we give them that bill, the most popular of those bills that we did, we know we had four of them. Um, two of them have sort of moved, or I should say three of them have moved around, like have been introduced or been worked on at the state level. Um, so far only one has passed into law, which is still a very big accomplishment, but not, not to say only one, but yeah, one it's of them pretty, is pretty, uh, it's a pretty big deal. <laughs> yeah. Just well, one. Well, only 50 just one states. Is, so <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and then um, that bill ended up being called our, our right to mine bill. Initially, originally it was called the uh, Digital Protection Act, and then it transformed into becoming the right to mine bill. And essentially that bill just protects Bitcoin miners from various forms of discrimination. Uh, we saw real-time discrimination taking place across the country, and we created real-time protections for that form of discrimination. And we were en ended up being able to pass that bill into law in two states, Arkansas and Montana. In fact, in Montana is one of the states where two things happened. One, we actually saw some of the discrimination taking place where, um, I don't know if you heard of the Missoula County there where they changed the zoning laws and they like went, drove a $20 million Bitcoin mining operation completely bankrupt because of it. So completely wiped them out all because they were concerned about things that were not true about Bitcoin mining, uh, you know, environmental concerns. Uh, um, oftentimes we see at the local level, not necessarily in Montana, but a big one is concerns around Chinese mining, um, particularly CCP mining, I should say, not Chinese owned, but just that they're concerned that the CCP controls them. So we saw real time discrimination taking place in Montana. We solved that problem. The other problem, the other thing we discovered while we were there that we learned is that we can add things to this bill. Um, and we'll get into sort of like where we got to from that point, but it was an important moment in the history of Satoshi Action. We added in a ban on any additional taxes on Bitcoin when used as a form of payment, which is critical. Because in the state of Montana, you know, if you, let's say you sell me a car, like they'll tax that. 
like peer to peer transaction. We'll just tax it like right off the top. So if I was to sell you some Bitcoin or pay you in Bitcoin, they would do the same thing. They'd be like, yeah. oh, are we, you owe us a tax for that. So we banned that, which was great. And um, yeah, we, we'll talk about it a little later, but that was our big initial success, huge success. Uh, a small tear came down my eye when I, when I passed my first bill into law. Uh, Eric was like, you know, done it 10,000 times. So he didn't, he didn't really care as much, but it was, a, it was a big <laughs> moment, but I was like, we've done it. We've done it. You know, like he was like, ah, uh, all right, nine, time for the next one. Right. So. Yeah. Right to mine. How'd you guys come up with that? It's like a very, it's very catchy. Right. And it's hard yeah. to argue against that. Uh, yeah. I can't, I don't know. I just can't. I you just you. It's just the yeah. brilliance top of the head. Okay. Came, came up with it, sent it to, I sent it to someone and said, Hey, you should call it this right to mine. I didn't even, we didn't publicize it. A, a really large news account. I said, Hey, just call it right to mine. That makes it more sense. Yeah. And they did. And then it just took off. Yeah. It was, it was interesting for sure. It's uh very memeable in the, in a good way. Okay. So you guys have passed some bills. You're creating like this donor network to be able to, to move it forward. You've told me about a few wins here. I want to hear about some of like the, the obstacles, which you already kind of alluded to. So, and we'll get to that later in the show, the discrimination, which we're seeing pop up right now, whether it be, Chinese Bitcoin miners who are being unfairly maligned for being associated with the CCP or not. And then also just like other Bitcoin miners who are you know, unwelcome in certain areas. But to the obstacles, what are some things that you've sort of like learned about uh, why you've gone through this process, uh, creating Satoshi Action Fund and moving forward into these different, uh, these different state houses to lobby on behalf of Bitcoin? Yeah. Um... I would say that an overarching theme to the work that we do is that things can go wrong very quickly and can be, can be unrecoverable. They can be recoverable, but they can also be unrecoverable. You know, politics is very much like the real world. Um, so when real world actions occur, there will be consequences or there will be, you know, either good or bad, right? You'll have good things or bad things happen because of real world actions. Um, I'll give an example of a positive real world example that leads to us to where we are today having a lot of success. And that is the current consistent uh, worry and fear around central bank digital currencies. So for some reason, um, which I definitely am aware of, uh, don't, don't, I can't share too much on the story, but uh, definitely aware of um, a lot of Americans became very, very concerned around uh, central bank digital currencies. And so eventually what happened was you had governors across the country, including Governor Nome and um, Governor DeSantis eventually working to ban central bank digital currencies at the state level. There was this big, huge kerfuffle around it and everyone was like doing everything they could to like stake their claim. Literally Governor Nome took out like a steel stamp of like a veto stamp and was like, <sighs> like stamped it into the bill. Like it was very, it was very cool actually. I loved it. Um, so all of a sudden this like firestorm picks up where central bank digital currencies become this thing that generally I would say uh, conservatives are against or Republicans are against, but like really, really opposed to like hyper opposed to it more so than I have seen anything in the, um, the crypto space broadly. I would, I would consider CC uh, central bank digital currencies to sort of be adjacent to the, to the crypto space. And because of that fervent, um, fear and concern around central bank digital currencies, we've actually been able to use it as an effective way to demonstrate the value of Bitcoin. Because what happened was initially when they said, oh, central bank digital currencies are a problem, people started to say, oh, well, Bitcoin is a digital currency. Is that also going to have the same problems as a CBDC? And of course, you know, we started education right away. Being like, no, these things are like way, way different. And then we just started to realize that it was best to classify them as polar opposites because they literally are like one is, you know, authoritarian sort of, at least when used on the retail level, go ahead yeah. and you know, send a CBDC between a bank or an institution. I don't, I don't care at all. Force yeah. it on individuals in the United States without proper regula regulations and regulatory frameworks. And then all of a sudden you have something that could be used in a way that, you know, is sort of unimaginable to some extent to manipulate human behavior. So we started saying, okay, these things are opposite. And now when we're going into these states and we're saying, okay, you should pass this bill. It's pro Bitcoin. Also it's anti CBDC. People are like, oh, hell yeah, let's go. Like we want to pass that bill. So that's one, that's one positive example of like how real world things have had a really positive impact on what we're doing. There's a lot of headwinds around creating or doing anything that you can to oppose CBDCs. 
Uh, and so and as we pitch Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, and um, you know all of our digital asset policy, where there's always that thought in mind of how can we tie this into um, concerns around CBDCs, which are valid and are linked. We are not making some sort of leap here. Bitcoin yeah. and CBDCs couldn't possibly be more more polar opposite. Gotcha. Tell tell me about the some other stories involving. I I have one video in mind of you going yeah. to Montana and speaking in front of, and I think oh. you know the one I'm referring yeah. to. Yeah. And there was someone before you who was just like going off and like kind of rabid and type. It was good. And then you came in after and like kind of calmly presented some counter information. Is this typically how the process is? Because I just think you are basically working in like the Parks and Rec version of Bitcoin. Where you have to like go <laughs> deal like these public Sometimes. officials and like they don't know anything about it. And they're like China bad, Bitcoin bad. That's that's my understanding every time I see this, which is a really unfair characterization of it. But it's also what's stuck in my mind. So lay it on. Yeah, no, it's more. it's it, you got you got it. You nailed it, right? Is the Montana <laughs> is the is the funnest example of just how wild it can be out there. So we go and we are getting ready to testify. And every time we testify, you know, especially because it's around Bitcoin mining, we do get some sort of pushback, usually at the local level, typically from environmental groups, which is unfortunate because there's so much, I mean, everybody knows in the mining space, there are so many benefits from the methane component to balancing renewables, uh, to balancing the grid. There's so many benefits that the, the, you know, Bitcoin mining space can offer to those that are come from even staunchly environmental, the staunchly environmental realm. So needless to say, there was two uh, opponents, strong opponents to the bill. Uh, one was a gal from an environmental group. She didn't get too out of control, but the second guy, he was a young, a young gentleman from, uh, from Montana, not originally. And he worked at the UCLA and he was very opposed to Bitcoin. And he started to go on this like speech, like this really long drawn out like monologue. And eventually at one point he says that that Montana will will like die on the cross of Bitcoin, essentially, right? It'll burn on the cross of Bitcoin. I can't remember the exact word he uses, but it's like very extreme, very dramatic. And then he goes on to say that people are dying because of Bitcoin money. And I was just like, <laughs> I, I wish the camera was on me. There's these cameras in every single um hearing room, generally speaking, every state capital building when you're testifying in front of these hearings, like they have cameras, just like DC, but obviously a lot, a lot lower tech. But I just remember when he said that people are dying because of Bitcoin. He was so, people are dying because of Bitcoin. He was so serious about it. I just remember looking down at my notes and just my face look, looking up at him was like so confused. And I just wish the camera would have caught it because it would have been a perfect, like, it would have been a meme like forever. But um, yeah, fortunately there's a lot of great policymakers out there and, and actually, you know, Sometimes people love to rag on these guys, but you know they do a good job. A lot of these guys, they do a good job. Yeah. Uh, one guy asks him, he says, uh, you know, he tries to run out. Actually, that's part of the story. This is an important part of the story. So let me backtrack. So he finishes his speech. He tries to leave right away, which you don't do. You never do. Very rude. Tries to leave, um, and as he gets to the door, one of the people is like, "Hey, before you go, even you, usually we do questions at the end. Let's have you do some questions right now, and we want to be able to talk to you a little bit. Bring him back up to the podium." He's like, now, son, um, you made some pretty egregious claims there around Bitcoin mining. Do you have anything to back up the statement that Bitcoin mining is killing people? And the guy <laughs> just is like, well, I don't have it here with me, but I can I can get it to you. And he just like this, this guy just is like, I mean, you got to remember this UCL, uh, UCLA guy is like um, uh, 22 years old. He's a kid. Yeah. Right? Great, great on him, though. Great. Love the love the getting active at a young age. But he's just like, son, if you're going to come in here and make egregious claims, you better have something to back it up. And the kid just was like so upset, like because he just got he gave this great speech and he wanted yeah. to just walk out, like drop the mic and walk out. Yeah. And he wouldn't let him. So he just blew him up. Uh, anyways, it was it was That's definitely so one of the good. most entertaining moments in the entire history of my experience. And it's only been a year and a half. So I, I'm really looking forward to other stories that I can tell in the future. Please catalog all these because yeah. I just like very specifically remember watching that entire video and, and laughing pretty hard because it was it was pretty funny. Um, okay, let's keep di diving into this a little bit more. What have you been seeing in a lobbying front that's been sort of helpful that you would encourage other people to look at? We've had the call lines. We've had the emails. We've had people going, speaking to people. 
I think for the Bitcoin community, we can all take like a breather and be like, a lot of what we've been doing has not been working. What has been working to, to speak with these people in state houses who need to learn about Bitcoin because Bitcoin's yeah. coming to their backyard. What has been working from your year and a half of doing this actively and putting boots on the ground? The things that have helped the most are, well, first of all, getting clear of FTX collapse. I mean, that is, this is what I've been, I just tweeted this out yesterday. It's like, I still can't believe that we passed two bills into law in the middle of that collapse. And it was a very testy time in the space. So getting clear of FTX is um, only going to help us. The other is just the way we approach the conversation around Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, the way we pitch it is that we really focus on the benefits. We do not talk about the technical side. We do not try to explain how Bitcoin or Bitcoin mining works. We give a very brief overview. If they want more information, of course, we will dive deeper with them. And we are very good at doing that. Uh, you always have to be ready for those questions. But it's very important to just keep it as simple as possible. Most of these policymakers have not made up their minds at all about any of this stuff. They hear it in the news. They're over there. They're, they're, they're nephews trading crypto, you know, like they're, it's like they got stuff all over the place. You know, you got some hardline anti-crypto, anti-Bitcoin Democrats. Um, you know, you've got some vocal Republicans, but they're not really like hardline yet. Like there's just not a lot of like really built in statements or viewpoints on this, on this technology. And so what we do is we just go in and we say, okay, like out of everything you've heard, a lot of, some of it is true. Some of it is not. But most importantly, what we're here to do is try to explain to you the value of Bitcoin mining for your state. So we pitch Bitcoin mining and we, it's the five benefits I mentioned earlier. It can bring jobs, local investment, grid stability, environmental cleanup, and the ability to enhance green and renewable energy projects. And out of those five, no one ever says anything bad about it. Obviously, they love all those things. But out of those five, usually a policymaker will say, oh, um, what kind of jobs does it make? Or like, you know, oh, I... I didn't know it could clean up the environment. It's like an instant like gateway to being able to have a conversation about something they care about because usually you're hitting on something there. Like if it's not the economy, if it's not the environment, if it's not energy, like at the local state level, like those topics are huge because the vast majority of energy policy is set at the state level. The vast majority of job creation is done at the state level. Um, and then a, a lot of this, these like sort of decisions around how much green energy they're going to be building done at the state level, a lot of environmental stuff done at the state level. Yeah, DC throws around big buckets, big buckets of money at everybody, and they certainly have regulations, but a, a lot of these decisions are made by local state policymakers. And so they care, they care a lot about these issues, probably themselves, but also their voters care a lot about those issues. Um, particularly the jobs one comes up a lot because we, we know in the mining space that we create a lot of rule um, and uh, jobs and jobs in economically depressed zones where it's very difficult to create jobs, nearly impossible to create like long lasting jobs. So the moment you say, oh, we create jobs in rural areas, they're like, boom, their brain turns on. They're like, well, how do you do that? Because that's really important to me. Um, as an example, in New Hampshire, we've I've been there a few times now. In the, there's an area called the North Country. There's like no jobs. It's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like they call it jobs for the North Country is like one of their pitches. Really? And so when we go there and we talk about Bitcoin mining, we're like jobs for the North country, jobs for the North country. It's because mm -hmm. it's true and it's something they care a lot about. So that, yeah, that's, that's generally how we pitch it. We do not talk about um, too much about Bitcoin. In the past, we haven't talked too, too much about Bitcoin to the extent that it's like, oh, yeah. you're going to need this because it's good as hedge for inflation or X, Y, Z. Like we, we sort of stay away from that and focus on things that like mining that we know will deliver value. Now we've expanded our policy. We've expanded the way that we, that we talk about it. Um, but we haven't gone into this new legislative cycle yet. So yeah. that was all done. Everything that you're, we just talked about that we've done and that we have done, it was done in early 2023. We prepped for it in early 20 or in late 2022. Now we are prepping for 2024 in late 2023. So we, okay. we sort of have an idea of where things are going to go and what we're going to do. And we're in a really great position. In fact, we could be active in up to 20 states. We probably won't be active in that many, but we have the opportunity to be active in up to 20 states. And as a, as a um, form of context, we only introduced law or excuse me, introduced policy in uh, seven states. So we were okay. only able to actually convince seven states to try to pass our bills. Whereas like this cycle, I think that number will be closer to like 10 or 15. Only seven states. That sounds like a lot of airline miles to me. So it can be. Yeah. Yeah.
this seems seems like a lot of work. Okay, so we got a lot of that laid out. Let's go and talk about some of the more aggressive headlines we've seen recently. And we're speaking about the New York Times article that dropped, I believe, a week ago. For our listeners, check out that in the show notes. We'll include that. I think we also talked about the news roundup last week. Essentially, there's a Cheyenne, Wyoming-based Bitcoin miner. They are owned and operated by a Chinese national group that has some ties, according to the New York Times, to the Chinese Communist Party. Essentially, the story boiled down to Microsoft is near this plant, this Bitcoin mining plant. The U.S. government has a missile silo nearby, an Air Force base nearby, and Microsoft is worried that this Bitcoin mining base could be used for foreign intelligence reasons. Then we also have the story down in Arkansas, which we'll get down to in a second. But let's start with this first one, this this thing with Chinese nationalist groups. Bitcoin mining, obviously, to to you and I, is more of an energy game. And it's very simple, right? It's just like plug in the machine, let it hash. I want to collect some Bitcoin. And then there's those five benefits you talked about. To outsiders, though, they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about all these people coming into rural areas and even foreign investment. Has that been a struggle when you've been talking to lobbyist groups or talking to uh, people in state houses? Have they brought this up to you? Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. It's um, it's a major concern. I would say most Americans, like average American, especially rural Americans, care a lot about the encroachment of uh, the CCP on on the United States from a, from a physical perspective. So, like from a uh, ge- geographical perspective, they don't like the idea of a CCP owned, controlled, or even highly influenced business, you know, being next to them, uh, and then definitely not being uh, in and around any sort of military installations. I believe the location in Cheyenne is near a, um, also, is that the one that's also near a nuclear plant or a nuclear uh, missile site as well? So yeah, something like that. Yeah. So I share, I share the concern. Like the, I think the premise is like, do you want foreign adversaries to be in and around any sort of um, military installation, any sort of critical infrastructure? You know, generally, I like my stance is like I'm very like pro people coming here, starting their businesses, you know, trying to accomplish the American dream. But at the same time, we also have to be concerned about whether or not those businesses have strong links to. Um, you know, the CCP or, you know, a lot of people care a lot about also like Russian oligarchs and their ability to influence America, American politics, American infrastructure. You know, the the big argument today is that the electrical infrastructure is a critical part of national security and that we need to be doing everything we can to protect it. And and, and I agree. I think that's important. All of those things are important that we should, we should keep an eye on them. The, the thing that I don't like is when the New York times tried to spin this article as if like, Bitcoin mining was some sort of like really powerful tool in the hands of the CCP, like next to these sites. Um, I don't think it really matters what business was there. I think it, you know, yes, a large load could potentially try to cause uh, interruptions, network interruptions with the electrical infrastructure. But we also need to keep in mind that any sort of nuclear military base is going to have so much redundancy that it will make your head spin. And what redundancy means, anybody that knows elect- electrical world knows, you know, and I'm, I barely do, right? It's like, I'm just a policy guy over here, but uh, redundancy basically means that they've built in so many fail safes so that to make sure that if the electrical grid goes down, if one of their generators, they, so they, then they go and they boot up their generators. If those generators go down, they have another backup, another backup. Like, I mean, these things have like countless backups. I actually was getting calls um, uh, and texts from folks in the Senate, in the US Senate, and they were asking me about this. And that was my final point to them. I was like, these things have so much redundancy in them. There's just no way that one little Bitcoin mining operation could do anything as far as what the New York Times is trying to claim. And that was really the final point. And they and they ended up being like, yeah, I've actually, you know, um, I've toured these sites before and they, they're, they're just sort of out of control with the way they do their redundancy. So yeah. um, I think that's the ultimate point. We should care about the CCP being in our back door, but we should not um, let it you know, for, no, we should not be believing these claims from the New York Times that these that mining can have any difference. And then also, I think I did a tweet thread about this. One really important part is we we really mustn't let our fear of the CCP allow us to say, oh, well, this person over here has a Chinese name and they own a Bitcoin mine. They must be part of the CCP. Let's go out and let's root them out. Let's get rid of them. Like that is unfortunately things that I have seen take place 
And I think that we should be really, really careful about the way we let ourselves kind of get up into a frenzy. We can be reasonable and responsible with our policy. We don't want to pass policy that we're going to later um, look back on and and with, with deep regret. So, no, I definitely echo your last point. The U.S. has a long history of using national security masked and it's really just industry concerns to uh, root out certain populations from being able to engage in things. So uh, there's a long history, especially the Chinese nationals in the United States, and just saying, hey, we don't want you in this industry. We're going to use national security concern around that. So that's the thing that I'm interested to see, and I hope it gets better, is around Bitcoin miners of Chinese descent or Chinese nationals themselves who have immigrated to be continue to be part of the Bitcoin story and they're mining here and they want to just mine Bitcoin uh, being like unfairly attacked for that. Uh, you could obviously see this as like a Tucker Carlson like bit, right? Where there's like people from yeah. other countries, CCP is mining Bitcoin and trying to take down uh, nuclear plants in the U S but we'll leave that there. I want to go over to the, the Arkansas story. So this obviously has large implications for what you're doing because you guys passed the right to mine bill or helped to pass up that bill in Arkansas. And my understanding is the pushback that we're seeing right now is directly correlated to this piece of legislation that you guys helped push through. So I'm gonna hand it over to you just to like kind of walk out the story that we're seeing in Arkansas right now uh, concerning this bill and the pushback on the local level. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a, this is a great story. No one's actually act known, uh, known enough about the story to talk to me about it. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, we have you doing the hard work, <laughs> doing the hard work here and uh, asking the tough questions. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, so I'll start from the beginning. In Arkansas, we were able to pass our right to mine bill there. It was the first state we passed it in. In fact, we passed it in, in one week. It was a probably an unbeatable record. Uh, you can thank Eric Peterson for that one. It's probably, he, he can live the rest of his life with that massive feather in his cap that no one will be able to that throne that no one will be able to dethrone him from. Right. Uh, so we passed this into law and then what happened was a, a few series of events and ultimately it led to a biz, a Bitcoin miner that was owned by someone with a Chinese name with a Chinese descent. And they built the site in a neighborhood very close to uh, residential buildings. In fact, um, I haven't been there on site myself yet, but I've heard that it's literally next door um, to a family. And that family has a child who has a form of uh, autism, is my, is my understanding, and that the autism, they have an auditory form of autism, which means that they basically can't deal with the noise um, and that it's a really big struggle for them. And I, um, you know, I feel I feel for that family. In fact, I, I, you know, part of what we do is we try to do everything we can to make sure this sort of behavior does not take place. Um, so let's just be, you know, I just want to be really clear about our intentions when we create policy. We create policy that protects Bitcoin mining, but it doesn't give leeway for bad behavior. It doesn't give leeway to bad actors. In fact, we, we, we state that in the policy to ensure that local government is able to go after these bad actors and people that are not behaving appropriately. Uh, but uh, needless to say, the town was up in an uproar after they could not get, in hold, uh, get a hold of the owner of this site. They could not get in touch, get in contact with them, try to figure out how to solve the problem. And so the, you know, the town went to the policymakers and they started, you know, creating a lot of trouble. Unfortunately, the, the unfortunate part is that there is this just perception that our, our bill actually protects people more than it really does. Like it's a very reasonable policy. It's like, don't zone me out of where I am and try to crush my business. Don't um, try to change my rate to a discriminatory rate, right? And and drive me out of business. Like, it's all just like, make sure we can stay in business. It's not, oh, I can do whatever I want and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Um, that would not, that type of policy would, not only would it be something that we would not craft, it is not something that would pass. Nobody wants to pass that kind of policy. Um, and so the law, if you go read it, it actually stipulates in there that, you know, this is just specifically for certain areas where um, things are zoned industrial, that any sort of noise complaint can't, can't be above and beyond what the current noise regulations are. So I, I'm, I, I don't know why people have come to this conclusion that the law somehow gives this, you know, these miners that are next to this family the free right to go in and do whatever they want, because it doesn't. Um, I think it's more just a punching bag for the frustration around what's going yeah. on. Um, fortunately, though, 
uh, we've had some good conversations locally. I, I, um, our team has been involved in, and we have seen some improvement in the the tone. Also, fortunately for us, they're not in a legislative cycle, so there's no sort of ability to go in and do anything about it right now. And typically, that's very useful if you want to keep that a law in place because they can't just go and turn and like get rid of it or ax it out. They have to wait till the legislator comes back. And in the meantime we are able to educate and talk about what the bill does and what the bill doesn't do. And yeah. we're also also to talk, also able to talk to the folks on the ground there and say, listen, we don't like this behavior either. And we're, we're glad you're bringing it up to us. In fact, it emboldens our desire to create a system where this sort of behavior is not able to take place. And as an example of that is uh, one thing that we've been working on for some time with the help of some of our board members um, on our C3 side, which we haven't talked about yet. So that's the research arm, education arm of Satoshi Action. Um, and the system would basically be like a rating system for miners. Like, you know, get the, I don't know if it'd be Satoshi or if it'd be something that we create external, mm -hmm. uh, but it would essentially be the premise to be get the, you know, get the Satoshi stamp of approval. And that way cities and towns and um, jurisdictions know who to work with and who not to work with like they know how what the risk profile is of someone so if you're coming gotcha. in and you've you've turned and burned 10 sites yeah and you've gotten noise complaints all over the place and your credit looks like shit you know and you've you're just not a good operator you're like oh, just a bad person bad yeah. business operator like communities should know that these small rural communities have no way of knowing who's trying to come in and do business with them now i'm all for legally being able to operate as a business you know i don't want to create a system where you're outlawing that type of business I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think, I don't want to get into the business of picking winners and losers, but um, there should be clarity from a local perspective. If you have no way of having visibility on this stuff, there should be some clarity provided when someone is going above and beyond to show that they are a good actor. Um, and we want to try to eventually create a system for that. We are, it's a, it's a long range project for us and we're still working on it, but that's something that we shared with them. And I think that the community there was you know, surprised that we were so invested in trying to protect them and not just the Bitcoin miners. Definitely. And this is a story that we've seen a lot, right? I remember some stories from Kentucky where this is happening. CNN did a piece, I think last year in a North Carolina site. And it's often these Bitcoin miners find cheap energy, it's zoned correctly, they throw it up really quickly and they don't build any sort of like noise right. barriers or walls. And then the town gets upset. The local builder comes through, throws up some sound barriers and no one really talks about it again. Now it could be better because I have been to some Bitcoin mines that are pretty close to residential sites still, and they still have like the sound barriers and it's still pretty loud nearby. So maybe that's just like an immersion question or something else. But I feel like this is just going to happen more and more and having some sort of transparency page would be a huge help for communities that eventually we want to like integrate with. Right. Cause I think like the five benefits you mentioned earlier, are certainly things that people want, but then there's just like this, one or two really irritating things uh, like sourcing jobs from other countries and then also like the noise that are getting in the way. So that's good. Yeah. Good proposal. Yeah. We want to do everything we can to, because we sort of view the success of mining in the United States, not just as like protecting mining, but also making sure that miners don't do things that will harm the industry. Most of the vast majority of miners are way beyond and above you know, doing what they should be doing, right? So this is just like very few small pockets. I can probably count on one hand the number of people, number of businesses I've I've sort of not interacted with, but been um, become aware of that are what I would consider to be bad actors. So just to to, to squash any fears that we're going to create some sort of like really stringent rating system and no one will be able to pass it. Like that's not what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to just accomplish that people are aware of those really bad actors who cause the entire industry way more harm. Um, and we don't, we don't need to be, we don't need to have that taking place if we create a rating system like this. It is something actually that other industries do as well. It's a form of self-regulation, which I'm very favorable towards. Um, and I will say, I'm also favorable towards, um, you know, not just internal regulation through a rating system that we sort of share with the external world. I'm also very favorable towards you know, government and public policy regulation. Obviously, I'm, that's what I do. But I think oftentimes within the mining space, even within the Bitcoin space, particularly the Bitcoin space, there's a lot of fear around government. There's a lot of concern over like, oh, 
like we should just have no government we should have no laws and that'll be a better world and i just like categorically just disagree with that because if uh, as an example like there's very you know i can i can shoot off some quick examples of like great regulation but one yeah. that's an easy one to understand that ties into the way that we approach our um, model with bitcoin or with satoshi action is uh, smoking regulations so smoking internal inside of a restaurant that was that's a form of regulation that was banned mm -hmm. um smoking in public places that's a type of regulation that was uh, put in place and they banned those smoking in public places, smoking in um, public restaurants. And I think most people will agree that that's a good idea. Yet when they tried to go accomplish that mission of making uh, a place where you could sit inside with no smoke in your face, uh, they were they were really stymied at the federal level. And so they actually had to go to the state level and pass all these laws. Like if you go and you look where are all the regulations around uh, smoking, um, and we're talking about cigarettes here to be to be clear. Yeah. Uh, when we're smoking cigarettes inside, smoking tobacco inside, that that regulation was passed at the state level, state by state, and it wasn't done at the federal level. So um, that's the same model that we take. We say, okay, I don't actually think we're going to be able to get what we want done at the federal level in the near term. Maybe long term we will, but in the near term, we need to assume that we are in a hostile environment where we're not going to be able to get anything done and that we need to start looking for other ways to move our agenda forward. And I believe, and my team believes fullheartedly that all of that work will be done at the state level. And not just because DC is not gonna do anything, also because the states are where all of the energy policy takes place at. Mm -hmm. If you want a demand response program, those happen at the state level. Your rate changes happen at the state level. Whether you participate in a power market, which is really valuable for miners, because then you start talking about all sorts of ancillary service programs, that all happens at the state level. Those decisions happen at the local level. So not only are we ensuring that we will always have a flank where we can advance our mission outside of DC, we're also ensuring that as we do that, that we're able to position ourselves to advance really critical and valuable energy policy for the Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining space. Good place to uh, leave with a final question. What are you guys looking forward to in 2024? Any, any like things you can throw at us before you announce it? Well, there's a lot of things in the works. Uh, one of them, which we've talked about a few times on other shows and other you know, um, panel appearances, is that we have maneuvered our right to mine policy to where it'll be more inclusive and uh, it'll encompass the, the broader digital asset Bitcoin ecosystem, which is good for two reasons. One is because it enables us to pass this policy that protects Bitcoin mining. All of the mining protections are still in there, but allows us to pass it not only in red states, which has been a little bit easier of a conversation for us, but also in purple states and even in blue states. In fact, we have two to three purple states that we're working in right now to be able to pass our new law, which goes beyond just Bitcoin mining. Like I said, it, it protects self-custody. It protects your access to Bitcoin, has all of the right to mine components in it. It also protects uh, nodes and node runners. So it will protect lightning node runners as well. It exempts Bitcoin miners and other technologies from having to get a money transmitter license. So all these really, really good things that are packed into one bill. Mm -hmm. But now we're talking about passing that policy, like I said, in up to 20 states. And they're not all red states. They are also purple states that lean blue. So we're really excited about that potential um, opportunity to you know, sort of set foundational policy across the entire country in 2024. Because if we don't do it, the other side is going to do it. We've seen what happens when you go to states like New York, where they go the wrong direction. Uh, yeah. looks like California sort of went that direction, not quite as bad uh, when, with the licensing regime. A lot of people didn't push back against that. So um, TBD on what model will be used across the country, but we need to start creating our own models, our yeah. own models of policy that we want to advance. Um, this, the second big thing that's coming out and we're still working on it is we have this very big paper that we've been working on for some time. We have it out for uh, academic review. So I, I didn't get into this too much with you, but we, we launched a research arm for Satoshi Action and we produce scholarly works through that entity with our science director, Dr. Murray Rudd. Dr. Murray Rudd, 20 years of academic experience, worked in the Canadian government, worked in the UN, worked. At, uh, he was a professor at universities across the world. And now he's helping us craft research um, and to be able to go out there and start really changing the narrative on Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. As an example, we didn't do the research, but the UCL paper that came out, Bitcoin's Carbon Footprint Revisited, that came from UCL by Juan and Alex, great researchers, love those mm -hmm. guys. Um, we helped get that through the peer review process and it is now in the public record. It is in the journals because of the work, some of the work that we did. We want to do a lot more of that. And that's yeah. what we plan on doing with this coming paper. And we think that that sort of work is critical for getting those in the middle and those opposed 
to move like shift, sort of shift the Overton window. Because if you start having peer reviewed papers come out that say Bitcoin mining is great for the environment, it's great for renewables, it's great for demand response, then all of a sudden you can really start to have conversations with those folks that are like, I don't know, you're just an advocate. Like, of course, you're going to say yeah. great things about Bitcoin. It's like, yeah, well, it's not just me saying it. It's the science is actually backing it up as well. Come for a digiconomist. That's good. We need someone to do that for once. Yeah, that's that's the goal. That's the goal. So um, that's the big thing. And then uh, other than that, we got our big dinner coming up. So November 17th during the Texas Blockchain Council. Uh, well, now it's the North American Blockchain Summit. Which yeah, they changed good, the name on everyone. And hey, it's a good rebrand. You know, it's like it you want to bring you want to bring everybody in, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I get that. But we'll be there. I'll be doing a fireside chat with Senator Ron uh, Senator Ron Wyden, and then I'll be doing um, a side event with him. And then we're going to be doing our dinner where he'll be keynoting as well. And we've got everybody coming. There's a wide spectrum of folks. Everybody from uh, you know folks from Marathon Riot. Uh, we've got several policymakers that are joining us. The TBC folks will be there. It's going to be a great one. Last year, we had 170 people, so we're trying to get 200 this year. So if nice. you want to go to that November 17th, I don't know if this episode will come out in time. We'll see. It will. It will? Okay. It will. You can you can use, uh, you know, 20, it'll just, promo code is just 25 off. You can get a 25% off on um, tickets to that. And all the money that we raise from that dinner goes to supporting our mission of advancing Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining at the state level, um, as well as research as well. So. Yeah, it's the right to mine. Time. There you go. Dennis, thank yep. you so much for joining the mining pod today. Uh, I feel like we could say like follow you on Twitter, but probably most people are. So you're probably good though, right? Just add Dennis. Maybe, Porter. yeah. I could always use a few extra followers, you know? Yeah, you know, one or two. One or two. Got to boost my engagement. <laughs> We're not in the bull market yet, but it's close. It's close. Where are you going to get next bull cycle? What's what's the top number you're looking for? Well, this whole, this whole idea of like FTX having basically traded paper Bitcoin and like shorting Bitcoin, the entire market actually has me feeling like even more bullish about where we could go. Oh, I'm talking as Twitter long as numbers, we not Bitcoin price. Oh, Twitter. <laughs> uh, Bitcoin well, price. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I bet I, I bet I could get, well, I'll get at least a 200 K that's for sure. Okay. But, but who knows? Could okay. get wild out there. I'm less aggressive on. So I spent a lot less time on Twitter now. I yeah. spent a lot time, more time producing for Satoshi action. So I might not get as, big of a boost as I did last time when I was just like breaking news every, yeah. every five, five seconds. Yeah. You know? and we different. had a show about it. We had a show about it. That was we like, did have a show about <laughs> it. A short lived show that had some good coverage of like Terra Luna and stuff like that, but it was very short lived. Oh, that's right. We were like live when it went, mm -hmm. when it was happening. God. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Memories right there. Put that yeah, in memory that's right. hole. <laughs> that's right. Cool. Well, we'll see you down in Dallas. Looking forward to that. And uh, again, thanks for joining the show. Lots of good information here, especially on like the, the discrimination stuff, I think, is the thing that's going to stick with me. So appreciate it. Thanks of for course. your time. Thanks for having me on, Will. Peace.